Friday. Good evening. Thank you for coming. We weren't sure if it would just be my husband and Megan's mom or if there would be some other people here. But we are very grateful that you wanted to hear about our trip. So we have chosen to title our presentation, Kelly and Megan Go to Poland. <laughs> we wanted to start with one of Eva's quotes, and I think that this quote um, really characterizes the Eva that I first met. So this whole story sort of started when I was in college. Uh, when I was a freshman, a sophomore in Indiana State, I um, realized there was a Holocaust Museum there. I had no idea there was a Holocaust Museum in Terrell until I drove past it. And um, so my roommate and I went in, and um, not very long after that, it was burned to the ground by an arsonist who spray painted, remember to me McVeigh on the side of the building, and then burned it to the ground. So I had been in the museum, but I had never met Eva, and my first look at her was a clip from the news where she's standing in front of the building and it's it's burned to the ground behind her and the, the reporter asks what happens now and she said well as soon as they put this out we're going to rebuild she said i survived hitler and some punks with spray paint and matches don't scare me and she was not having a pity party at all. And out, out of all the things that have happened to her over the course of her life, um, I have never, I do not believe that she has ever tried to solve a problem with a pity party. This is what the museum looked like after the arsonist got done with it. You can still see the uh, spray paint on the side, remember um, Timmy McVeigh. I haven't forgotten. I was arguing with the survivor once and I said, how dare you say I forgot? The next interaction I had with Eva was when I went to the library at Indiana State and they were showing uh, the release of the first documentary about her life, Forgiving Dr. Mengele. And there was a panel of other survivors um, at the library and they did this discussion where Eva said, I have forgiven the Nazis I had to give up that hatred, and there were a lot of other survivors there who strongly disagreed with her position, who felt like she didn't have the right to disagree or to forgive them, who felt like um, it was disrespectful to forgive them, and so that was really sort of the start of this journey with Eva. And so now you get to hear my story. Um, when I started teaching the sophomore English class, I was going to teach the book Night by Ellie Wiesel, who was also uh, a Holocaust survivor. And Megan, who was teaching next door, um, for whom I had taught before, said, you know, you really should take the students to see this Holocaust survivor that I know from Terre Haute. Um, and that was really interesting to me. So what happened was I began taking every year the sophomores to meet her, hear her story, experience the museum. So what you see here are a couple of pictures from trips. Um, a couple of times Megan has needed to take students due to various scheduling problems. So you see here, her here with one of the docents at the museum. His name is Walter? Yeah. Yes. Um, he is, he actually escaped before um, Germany fell completely into Nazi hands. Um, so his story is a little different. There are several docents there who tell a little different story. 
And then you'll see a picture here of Abby and I on one of those trips. So I became very interested in Eva's story through that. And that was something that Megan and I began to share more and more. Here you see then how we made it to um, the idea of going with her to see Auschwitz and to experience that along with Eva and many others. Um, one day when we were at band day, I guess this would have been 2017, yeah, band day 2017, she happened to be speaking at the state fair. And so Jacob, who had met her when he was a sophomore, got to see her again several years later, have her sign a book, and they were advertising, you'll see there, the trip itinerary. And I immediately texted Megan, we had talked about this several times because they go every single year, and it was like, the fact that she was there made me feel it was time for us to go. So I texted her and I said, why are we not doing this? Time's not getting any shorter. And so she texted back. Chad said we should do it. And that was the beginning of us really getting serious about going on the trip. So first, we want to give just a very brief history lesson. Um, when Hitler invaded Poland in 1939, the rest of the world did very little. Um, it took threats to Western Europe, Russia, and eventually the United States to get um, any serious opposition against the Nazis in Poland. Um, for the Jewish population, this action came too late. In 1939, the Jewish population in Poland was 3.2 million. By, or today, in 2018, the Jewish population in Poland is only 10,000. The city that we visited um, was Krakow, that's where we stayed, and I think we were both very unprepared for how much we were going to love Krakow. So we went on this trip to be with Eva and see Auschwitz, and we ended up falling in love with this city and its history and its people. Um, the oldest church in Krakow is St. Andrew's, and it was built in 1079. I'm going to show you a picture of that in just a second. The city square is over 700 years old. This is where we ate most of our meals and spent most of our time. Um, the cathedral in the palace yard was built in the 14th century, and the palace itself was used until the 16th century. So we were able to go into the castle where the kings of Poland had been coronated and um, were entombed and saw this rich history of a city that we had basically never thought about at all. These are the two churches that um, were the most powerful, I think. There's many churches in, in Krakow. These two stuck out, or stood out, stood out the most. Um, the first one there is St. Mary's, and the second one is St. Andrew's, so that's the one that was built in 1039. Both of these churches are still used every Sunday uh, by people in Krakow. So both of these churches are still in use today. This is the city square. Um, you can see the church in the background, and then that is a large, um, they call it a mall, but it's not really like our malls. There's open uh, markets where there's vendors, there's fresh vegetables and fruits and flowers, um, and then different vendors inside that open air uh, building there that's been used since medieval time. This is the Valkyl Castle, where uh, the coronations for the uh, princes and the kings and queens of Poland took place. This is uh, a very interesting building because there's so many different stages of it. You can see the different types of architecture. This was one of the only places the Nazis did not loot in Krakow. And the people in Krakow say it's because there's a dragon that protects it. And in front of the church, when you go in, there's that large bone that they say is a dragon bone. And that is what protected this church from the Nazis looting it. But all of the gold and precious metals were left alone inside this building, and that was the only one that the Nazis, the Nazis lived in it and worked in it and were in and out of it all the time, but they didn't take anything from this, 
this particular building in it is the only one. So another piece of the history of Krakow that is important as we consider the story of what happened um, when the Nazis invaded um, Poland and what happened during the Holocaust is this piece of information. Around 1450, King Casimir invited Jews, very specifically reached out to Jews in Europe and invited them to come and settle in Krakow. And so after that, for hundreds of years, Jews and Christians, because Poland is a very Catholic, very Christian country overall, but Jews and Christians in Krakow lived together in harmony for hundreds of years. So that is really important in understanding how devastated Krakow was by what happened during the Holocaust. Not just the devastation to the Jews, but the devastation to Krakow as a whole and to the culture that had developed there over hundreds of years. So what we did on that first day that we were in Krakow is we toured around, and one of the things that we toured in, one of the areas we toured was the old Jewish quarter. And so what you see here is one of um, kind of the outside streets of that Jewish quarter, that historical Jewish quarter that has been um, kind of revitalized into shops and those kinds of things. And so these would have been the buildings that those Jews were living in um, before World War II. Oops. Here you see Meg and I with a statue of Jan Parski and um, that's a really interesting character that some of you might want to research if you're very interested in World War II. Um, he is revered in Poland because um, before the general population of like the United States, for example, or the European population really understood what was happening during the Holocaust, he had already published a book during World War II that made it very clear what was going on. Um, so um, I'm actually partway through that book. It's kind of dense. <laughs> so I made it all the way through. It's very interesting to think that somebody was telling this story that seemed like it was very hidden, and yet he had risked his life to go in and find out what was going on. Here you see just some other various pictures. Here's a memorial. You'll notice that it's very simple. Um, the Jews, the Jewish culture believes in a very, very simple memorial. Um, and, and rocks are very important to them because um, rocks symbolize kind of the long history because a rock is around for a long, long time. And so any place that you would see that, um, that Jews from other parts of the world had come to visit, you'll see that they have left rocks um, laying around. So this is a memorial that is just very simply a rock that talks about the Jews in Krakow. Um, over here, you see us in another portion of the Jewish quarter, and um, if you have watched Schindler's List, you'll notice that this is used in Schindler's List. It's used as if it is part of the ghetto. It never was. It was part of the old Jewish quarter, but it was so well preserved that they chose to film there. And so this is me standing beside the um, staircase that, and I, I still don't time I saw Schindler's List, so I don't really remember this, but apparently someone hides under a staircase, and that is the staircase that they hide under. Here you can just see some of the historic buildings um, that are there in the Jewish quarter. Very, very typical of what Krakow looks like when you get kind of away from the city center and into the streets of the city. This is um, a cemetery, a Jewish cemetery, behind a very historic synagogue in the area. Um, and some of these you can see predate World War II, so um, it's very fortunate that those survived, many did not. Um, and during the time that the Nazis occupied Krakow, this would have been used for a trash dump. And so basically they were preserved because the trash was piled on top of them. And then I thought this was incredibly interesting. When, um, after World War II, when preservation efforts got underway to try to kind of reclaim what had been desecrated and destroyed, one of the things that um, the people of Krakow did was they built this wall around this ancient cemetery 
and they used some of the gravestones that had fallen down that they couldn't replace, they couldn't put them back onto the graves where they went. And so to memorialize those people, they actually made the wall out of them. So as you walked along this wall, you could look at and touch and feel the different gravestones of um, people that, you know, otherwise are kind of lost in history. Krakow, during uh, much of Poland's history, was the capital of Poland. Today, the capital of Poland is Warsaw. Um, but Warsaw doesn't have nearly the historical landscape that Krakow does, because 95% of Warsaw was demolished during World War II. Krakow was the Nazi stronghold, and so it was very well protected, and so the buildings there uh, predate the war by hundreds of years and are still in use still in use today. Um, it's still very much a cultural center of Poland, even though it's no longer the, the capital. And um, there's so much rich history here. This is what McDonald's looks like in, in Krakow. I mean, even, even the McDonald's is beautiful and in a, a historic building. And um, it, it was just a completely unreal experience to be in a place where we were eating in buildings where people ate during medieval times. And so um, one of the things that we did was go to a salt mine. And so here are some pictures. I didn't have very many expectations for what I was going to see at a salt mine. Um, but again, we were shocked by how beautiful it was. We don't think about mines being beautiful. Um, that chandelier above our head in that picture is made completely of salt. It looks like crystals, but it's salt. Um, that was the elevator that we rode down into the, the bottom of the shaft. We were there for two and a half hours, and we saw 1% of the salt mine. This is a, all of these statues are made completely out of salt. This is um, telling a little bit of the history of Poland and Warsaw. They have these statues um, that have lights come and shine on them, and they tell you who all these people are, and just some of the history of King Casimir and, um, and Krakow in general and, and Poland. There are multiple underground ponds in the salt mines, and when the Nazis occupied Poland, they took over the salt mine as well. And they were selling salt, sending salt back to, to Germany. Um, the water in these ponds is so rich in salt that you cannot become submerged in it. They used to have boats that they would travel from one part of the mine to the other. And um, so all those pennies that you see are floating on top of the water. It's a little bit difficult to see in the picture, but none of the pennies are submerged. And while the Nazis were in the salt mines, they took a little pleasure cruise on one of the, the ships through the, the mines and capsized the ship, which was a problem because they were all stuck under the boat. And the, the water is so salt dense that they couldn't even submerge themselves long enough to get out from under the boat. So they're, the boat is flipped over, they are under the boat in the little air pocket, and they cannot go under the water long enough to get out from under the boat. And they were all killed in this boating accident inside the mines. Um, and they no longer do any sort of, of uh, Pleasure cruises, or, or even like any, like they don't have any boats that go through there anymore. Um, but the dragon that was supposedly in the, the Polish castle um, had an area of the mine that he protected too, and so they say that you know he was behind flipping the boat and and taking care of at least some of the Nazis. So in Krakow, before. 1941, there were 68,000 Jews just in Krakow, just in the city of Krakow. So we told you the, the um, statistics for Poland as a whole, but just in this one, and it's not a humongous city. Um, it is a city, but not huge. 3,000 of the 68,000 survived the war. Um, and 1,000 of those 3,000 survived directly because of Schindler's factory and what he did to save them. So 
Um, it was just a staggering statistic to think that six, you know, what is that, 65,000 people vanished from the earth from this one city. There's a memorial in the section of the city that was turned into the Jewish ghetto, and it has 68 chairs. So this would have been the assembly area within the ghetto, um, which would have been a really cruel place um, for all the time that the ghetto was in operation. And so um, a sculptor and, and artists have come in and they put these very simple chairs here to represent the 68,000. And it was, that was a very, very powerful part of our touring that first day. This is the section of the ghetto wall that has remained. So it's been preserved very much on purpose. Interestingly, there are just buildings around it. People are living in them. And I think that there were apartment buildings right beside it. Um, so, you know, the people of Krakow Krakow go about their daily lives, but right here in the middle of their life in 2018, you can see um, a part of the ghetto wall. One thing that is interesting to note about the ghetto wall is it is built in the shape of um, Jewish gravestones. Everything the Nazis did was deliberately done to humiliate and demoralize the Jewish people, even down to the way that they built the wall around the ghetto. If they had time to build it out of concrete, then they built it to make it look like they were living in a cemetery. We visited Auschwitz, which is what we um, were really signing up to do, but we were also able to visit another concentration camp that was inside of Krakow. This was much smaller, Auschwitz was the largest concentration camp um, during the Nazi regime, but there were many concentration camps that were much smaller and in various places. At Plaschow, there were 10,000 people who were killed, 25,000 prisoners um, overall. This was primarily used for Jewish and political prisoners, uh, but it was used for a number of years. It was used from 1942 to 1945. It was strategically placed um, at the site of two Jewish cemeteries. And they had these Jewish workers come in and dismantle the cemetery. So they were taking apart gravestones belonging to family members, neighbors, people that they had known, and turning these headstones into the roads and the basements for the buildings in this concentration camp. This concentration camp, um, it had 200 barracks, so it, it was small compared to Auschwitz, but it's still a very, it was a very large uh, camp where people were held. Most of what you see there today is signage and this uh, large memorial. The Nazis destroyed this camp almost entirely before they left. There's no buildings standing there, there are no really even foundations that you can see, but Krakow is very consciously working to recreate this site as a memorial. So the people from Kandel said every year when they go, there are more monuments at Plaschow, there are more pictures, there's more information, it's, it's put back together because the Polish government is, is very invested in making sure that this part of history is not forgotten. That these people who were Polish citizens primarily um, are not erased in the way that, that they were tried to be. This is a picture from Plaschow, so it, it looks just like a park. I mean, it's, there's very little to denote where buildings were or, or what was going on. Um, it's, it's sort of a blank landscape where 10,000 people were killed. Today in Krakow, there are 150 Catholic churches that are in use. There are also 150 Jewish residents. So you, you go from a time where there were 68,000 Jewish people in the city of Krakow um, seven working synagogues. We're down to two working synagogues in uh, 
crack on out, and they're very sparsely attended. There's two, two synagogues for 150 Jewish people. Uh, but that's the result of, of what the Nazis were able to do. They took a, a population of 68,000 down to 150. And I would just kind of add to that, when we visited, um, when we visited Candles last spring, we saw, my sophomores and I saw Walter, that you saw the picture of um, him and Megan earlier in the presentation. And Walter explained that he has gone back to Germany. Um, he said they had graciously invited him back and really treated him very kindly. I think they do that with Holocaust survivors in Germany today. And um, he said that the tour guide was driving around, they drove past this beautifully restored, um, Jewish synagogue, and he asked their tour guide because she was very proud of the restoration efforts that had taken place, and he said, how many people attend that synagogue? And he said, her face just fell, and she said, none. Jews won't live in Germany. And so, you know, they had attempted to repair, but they don't have any Jewish population. This is Simon, and he was our guide while we were at Auschwitz and at Birkenau. And he was everybody that we, we were in a group of about 100, and we were broken up into to three different groups at Auschwitz, and we all felt like we had the best guide, but I am certain that Simon really was the best guide. Um, he, you can see from that picture there, he did not mince words. He was a very sort of straightforward person, and there were three things that he said over and over and over to us. Uh, while he was taking us around the camps. And the first thing that we put on the slide is forget about it. He would make very sure that we left any preconceptions we had about what Auschwitz was like at the start of the tour. He would say things like, you think that it would have been easy to escape? You think people could have could have survived this just out of sheer, sheer willpower? Forget about it. Forget about it. Forget about it. He would present all of these things that would be easy for people to believe, and he would forget about it. He would just prevent us from, from continuing to believe things that would be easy to believe that were, were wrong. But then there were other things that he would say, you must remember this, you must remember this. So he told us things to forget, and he told us things that we definitely had to remember, and the thing that he said the most often was do not forget, do not forget. Simon's father, worked in the Polish underground after World War II. And one of the things that I uh, found the most interesting about what Simon shared about his experience was what Poland was like after World War II. So he would say things like, it's easy for, for the rest of the world to believe that World War II ended and everything was better. He said, but we were left here and we were left under a dictatorship from Russia. Russia didn't leave. So the people came in, they came to the concentration camps, and they left, but Poland was still not a free nation. Poland was still very much under the rule of a dictator who was not kind to the people of, of Poland. So even after World War II, Poland was very much oppressed by a group of people that wanted them to, to be erased. I mean, they wanted Poland to become a part of Russia and for Poland's history and heritage and culture to sort of merge with their own. One thing that Simon talked about a lot was this newspaper article. So when I got back, I looked it up. And this was in the New York Times, um, December 11th, 1942. So one thing he kept saying is, people say they didn't know, but people should have known. In 1942, I think it was page 13 um, of the New York Times, this article appeared with the headline, Poles asked allies to halt slaughter. Report Germans had slain one third of Jewish population, end of nation is feared. This wasn't even front page news in 1942 in America. So um, we're gonna, we need to explain first that we're showing you these next two sections backwards from the way we experienced them. Because we went with candles and we went with Eva, um, the staff of candles and Eva herself think it's important to visit Birkenau first 
which was her main experience, so that she can share her experience and then go to what's called Auschwitz I, which was the original concentration camp at Auschwitz. Um, but we've chosen, because of historical timeline, we want to kind of show you that backwards, but just be aware that we went first to Birkenau, and that was our first experience, and then the second day of touring at the camp, um, we ended up in Auschwitz I. But Auschwitz, um, Auschwitz I, which was the first political prison camp, um, had originally been barracks for the Polish army, is what it was. Um, but when it was taken over by the Nazis, in June of 1940, they began to bring in the first Polish political prisoners. So the beginning of the concentration camp was a political camp. They were the elite of Poland, and that was really interesting to me, that the Nazis immediately began to attack the elite. And by that I mean political leaders, I mean um, college professors, anyone who was a thought leader in Poland, because what they wanted to do was they wanted to eliminate anyone who was brave enough or intelligent enough to stand up in opposition to them. And so the first prisoners that showed up at Auschwitz were those kinds of political prisoners. Then, in June of 1942, so two years later, they began to bring in Jewish prisoners. That's kind of the beginning of this idea of the final solution that most of us know today. Um, and an interesting thing that was said at some point during our trip that really stuck with me was, Germany really wanted to conquer the USSR. They wanted to conquer Russia. On the way, they conquered Poland. And remember how many Jews there were in Poland? And so that is why they needed a solution. They had a problem in their mind. They had all these people that they considered to be undesirable that they had just basically inherited from Poland. And so that's why we, they called it their final solution. And the other thing that really stri struck me about Auschwitz I was that the Nazis began to experiment there with the most effective ways to administer a factory of death. And they really, really were working to create a factory whose product was death. And they practiced it very hard at Auschwitz I and then transferred it to Birkenau, which we'll talk about here in just a minute. So as we arrived, and this, remember, would have been our second day of the camp, but as we arrived at Auschwitz I, it's notable, remember this was originally a German, I mean, I'm sorry, a Polish army barracks, it's notable that this is a beautiful place. It's beautiful. This is us walking up, um, getting off the bus, this is our first impression. This is outside, waiting in line to go in. Okay, this is not an ugly place. And so to imagine the people who endured it and how ugly it became was just really kind of interesting and difficult for our minds to accept. Here you see the uh, famous sign going into Auschwitz, work makes you free. These are the beautiful trees. Many of these trees would have been around when the Nazis were there, when the people were dying. It's a really, really powerful experience to be there and to realize that. Here you get another kind of sense of the fact that this basically looks like a college campus. Beautiful barracks laid out and on even streets. It doesn't look like a place of torture. I don't know if you can tell very well from where you're sitting, but the original army barracks would have been one-story buildings. And so what you can see here, if you look really carefully, is the little bit of difference in the color of brick between the lower story and the second story. So what the Nazis did was they came in, they took off the roof, they put a second story on each of these, and then they put as many people as they could possibly squeeze into these barracks. 
So it looks beautiful until you start looking a little closer. And so you can see here a typical guard shack. The guard shacks were built into the wall. So in front of that guard shack, you'll see a couple of rows of barbed wire, which would have been electrified. And then you see the tall um, kind of fencing that is behind there. And then behind that would have been a road. Oh, and over here, you see the one picture of Hitler that was left behind and has been preserved in an office of one of the officers there. Here you can begin to see what those prisoners would have walked by every day. And when you get up very close, you can see the electrified fencing. You can see the sign that would have said, warning, danger of death. My students who are here in the audience know that in night, Elie Wiesel refers to that sign. And he says, everywhere here, there was danger of death. What an irony to have a sign that says, warning, danger of death. And then here, what you see right here is the chimney of the first of the crematoria at Auschwitz. And when I tell you that it was a place of experimentation, this was one of the most horrifying stories. And I actually read this while we were there. I was reading a book, um, and I read about this. So this wasn't told to us by our guides. But as they began to experiment with extermination, they would try various methods of getting the people into the crematorium in a way that would keep them from creating mass hysteria. And so this was their experimentation area. And so there was a roof that Nazi officers would stand on and they would watch as kind of the lower officers would try these different techniques of getting the people to go inside without basically stampeding and trying to get away. And they would, they would try this way, and then they would try another way, and then they would try another way. It was just mind-blowing to me. Experimenting with people to see how easily you could convince them to walk into a place where you were going to exterminate them. And so when we, you know, most of us now know about the showers. That was what they finally came up with. We will convince people that they are going to go in and take a shower. And that was particularly effective because if you convince people they're going in to take a shower, you can convince them to take off their clothes, and then you don't have to take off their clothes after they're dead in order to send those clothes back to Germany and use them for other people. I, it's so cold and calculating and just it was very difficult while we were there for me to wrap my mind around that aspect of it. Even the, the crematorium that you see there is built purposely in the, the side of the hill so that Nazi officers could walk up the hill to drop the Zyklon B tablets down into the shower rooms so they didn't have the added burden of climbing on a roof and climbing off a roof or having people wonder you know, why people were on top of the roof was just built directly into the side of the hill, which gave them easy access to the top of the building. So, kind of my final thought for Auschwitz one for you. Contrary to the words on the sign over the entrance of Auschwitz, the concentration camp was not designed for labor. It said work makes you free, but it was never designed for labor. It was designed for torture, and the intended outcome was death. It was not work. So they might have called it a concentration camp, but what they intended it to be was a factory of death. What actually was able to set some people free um, was survival. And in, in many ways, survival was arbitrary from whether you survived a selection or whether you were able to steal enough potatoes or whether um, you just happened to be in the right place at the right time. 
And what we what we see here, this is an Auschwitz one. This is not a Birkenau. This is Barrack 10, and this is where uh, Dr. Mangala performed the medical experiments on the twins, which is how Eva survived. Eva was a twin. When she got off the train at Birkenau, the rest of her family was sent to the gas chambers, uh, but a Nazi officer asked whether she and her, her sister were twins, and her mom said, is that good? And the, the officer said yes, and she said yes, they're twins, and she pushed Eva and, and Marion towards the SS officer, and that was the last time they saw anybody in their family. So they would be, the twins were marched, and these were all little children, they were marched two miles from Birkenau to Auschwitz I for the experiment. So this, this lab here, lab, or there at 10, is where Dr. Engel's lab were, and this is where she would have come to have the different experiments done, um, and the different procedures were, were done here. And um, this is a picture of Eva outside of Barrett 10 while we were there. And I think one of the most powerful parts of this experience was being able to be there with someone who could sit and smile like that outside of the barrack when she was tortured, who was a twin sister. Um, this, is a, this was a heavy trip, and it's a heavy presentation, uh, but it was broken up and punctuated by moments where Eva would laugh, where Eva would say, why aren't we smiling? The Nazis are gone, we're celebrating. And you could see other groups at Auschwitz that didn't have that. And there were different parts of the trip where we were there and other groups who were at, at Auschwitz would realize who we were with. And you could see their entire demeanor change when they realized that there was a survivor there. And that um, she, it was just such a powerful experience to be able to be in a place like that with someone who had the right to smile and who could make us smile. One of the things that I overheard Eva say while we were on this trip is getting even has never healed a single person. And so I felt like um, she has been able to in many ways heal herself and it wasn't by getting even. One of the things that we did, uh, this is the path that the Russians marched the prisoners down when they were liberated. So Auschwitz was liberated by Russians. Um, something that's interesting is that when, when the Russian army showed up and realized what was there, they, before helping, left. So the Russian army showed up, saw Auschwitz, saw what was happening, and went back home. They went back home to get cameras. They wanted to be very certain that the liberation of Auschwitz was documented by them so that they could say to the world, we did this, we freed these people. And so the Russian army showed up, they saw what was happening, they left, they came back with movie cameras, and then they took the prisoners, including Eva and her twin sister, and they marched them down this path multiple times with a news camera so they could get a good shot. And so there's a very famous liberation picture Eva and Miriam are in the front of it, and that's the result of, of the Russian uh, setup of this liberation. That's not how the liberation actually happened. That's just how Russia recorded it, them walking down this path. In that picture, Eva and Miriam were wearing striped jumpsuits. The twins were never required to wear those, but the Russians wanted them to wear it in the picture, so they looked like prisoners. And, uh, they made them march up and down until they were satisfied that they got a good shot, and they said, okay, you can, you can go back and eat or rest or, or do whatever. We, uh, when Eva was telling us that story, we were standing there, it was raining that morning, and um, then we walked down the path of liberation with her, and they, they took our pictures. So that's our pictures uh, with Eva at the liberation. This is in one of the barracks at Auschwitz I, and that's the picture that I was talking about. And on the days that we're there, Eva stays in this barrack. After she tells us the story outside of um, Barrack 10 and after we do the liberation walk, she spends most of her day in this barrack uh, where her picture is. She has her hand on her, so she's touching the picture of herself uh, as a little girl while we're there. And then she's there the rest of the day while other visitors of Auschwitz come in and realize who she is and she talks to them and shares her story. 
Uh, she claims to be, on the days that she's there, the only living exhibit at Auschwitz. She told us a story while we were in this room that once, um, many years ago, she was visiting Auschwitz and she was talking in this room to one of the, the museum employees. Auschwitz is a museum, it's a Polish national museum. She was talking to one of the, the museum employees and they started laughing about something. And this woman walks up to Eva and taps her on her shoulder and she says, I don't think that you understand where you are. You're not being very respectful and I think that you need to be quiet. And Eva grabbed her by her elbow and marched her over to that picture and she pointed at it and she said, you see that little girl? That little girl is me. And if I want to laugh here, I have the right to laugh here. And she said that like, it was like, oh, I'm very sorry. You know? But, um, it is a very unique experience to be in a place like that with someone like that. So much so that other people sometimes don't you know, recognize or understand who, who is there and, and why they're you know, able to be happy. Because most people, you know, this is a very reverent place. It's not some place that people are, are talking and laughing and, and um, behaving in a way that we would typically behave in a museum. And there are certainly places where we were also incredibly reverent. Right. Um, nobody is allowed to take pictures in um, the areas where, for instance, I mean, except with very special permission, like you might see on a documentary today, um, in where, like, the hair is kept um, that are, is from the victims, because really that's basically like a cemetery, because uh, that's the piece that's left of those people. And so we took no pictures in those areas. And so they're certainly still very reverent areas. But Eva is all about living. She is all about living. And Megan already referenced this once, but you know, when we would start to seem serious or we would start to seem sad, she would say, smile, the Nazis are gone. Smile, the Nazis are gone. And that's, that is her story. All right, so Birkenau. Birkenau is where she spent a lot of her time. That is where she lived. So she was marched over to Auschwitz I. Birkenau, though, is a very, very different place. Um, Birkenau is very somber when you're there. Um, it looks like a big open field because most of the barracks were actually torn down and used to build homes after World War II, to be honest with you. Um, but Birkenau was where the Nazis perfected the factory of death. So a few pieces of information. 40 square miles were evacuated around it to try to keep it secret while it was in operation so there were not people living nearby. It remained under construction until it was evacuated. And the interesting thing to me about this was it was under construction because even though they felt they were nearing the end of their Jewish problem, they anticipated conquering many more nations and having lots more undesirable people that they needed to get rid of. And so they intended for this to be a factory of death for who knows? who they would have decided was impure and not worthy of life. And so their intention was to keep it running as they conquered the world. In May of 1944, a railroad platform opened inside of Birkenau. So the pictures that we see and that we are very familiar with um, of Birkenau with the, the train tracks running into the camp, were at, that was actually a very late addition. It was put in place to receive the transport of the Hungarian Jews. And so, for those of you who have read Night, for those of you who will be reading Night this year as sophomores, um, when you read about Ali Wiesel's story, he's a part of that transport. And actually, Eva was an early part of that transport as well, because even though she was from Romania, she had been transported into Hungary and then was transported onto Auschwitz. 80% of the Hungarian Jews who arrived were liquidated immediately. So this image that many of us have, if you've studied anything about Auschwitz, of people getting right off the train and being selected and being sent immediately to the gas chambers and the crematoria, we are, we are mostly learning at that time about this Hungarian transport, which was just unbelievable, the amount of people who were uh, annihilated in a short, short period of time. 
Birkenau, and I've said this several times, but I just really want you to understand because this made such an impression on me. It was the result of an ever-changing modern industrial business plan. These were businessmen. They had a plan and they were as efficiently as possible making that plan come to pass. That was their goal. I'm gonna go fast so we can get through what we need to here. There were 90,000 90, people on 200 acres, 450 people per acre when it was at its biggest. The word Birkenau in German means birches, and that's what the Nazis referred to this part of the camp as because there were so many natural birch trees there. Um, so we, it's Auschwitz too, but they referred to it as, as Birkenau, which was a reference to the beautiful landscape and trees that were there. And many of these trees that we were with when we were there would have been there um, at the time that the concentration camp was in use. This is the gate that the trains would have gone through, and then we were allowed to go up into the, the tower at the top there. So the second picture is what the guards would have seen from that guard check. So the first picture shows where the trains entered, and the second picture is standing at the top of that building, looking out at the platform, and the two uh, crematoria there would have been at the far end of that picture right before those trees. They had two identical mirror image crematoria at the end of that, that row. So you would get off the train and go straight down uh, to the, the two crematoria. This is inside one of the barracks that's still there. This would have been a restroom barrack. This was just half of it. Um, prisoners were given five minutes in the morning to use the bathroom, and that was it. And they were expected not to use the restroom the rest of the day, and could be killed if caught using the restroom. This um, is a barrack, and this would have been where people slept, usually four people to a bed. There is a bottom level, this middle level, and a top level. This actually uh, is a building that is now owned by a Catholic church. Um, it was a part of Birkenau, it was an officer's quarters, uh, but a Catholic church came in and said we would like to buy this building and, and change its history and, and use it for, for something that can provide good to, to this community. And so this is now, that's no longer part of Auschwitz, it is now a Catholic This is a couple of pictures of the fencing just to show how heavy duty their, ramif or their barricades were. Um, you know, sort of like Simon said, you think people could escape? Forget about it. This is the train platform where uh, Eva and Ellie Wiesel and others would have been taken off of the trains upon arrival and sent uh, mostly to the gas chambers. And there's a train car that they leave on it to sort of show you perspective, that's what one train car um, looks like in that landscape. So, the bottom line, efficiency at Birkenau. Five years, Auschwitz won, and then later Birkenau was added. Five years, it was in existence. 1.3 million people were deported. 1.1 million of them So here is Eva beside that train car. And so again, here we are in Birkenau, this place of death, and she has transformed it. She has now visited how many times? Over 30. Yes. And so it almost, one of the, one of the candles workers said, it's almost like coming home to her. It's where her family perished. And so to her, she had, I think she had to transform it in her mind. So what you see here is her reading a letter of forgiveness to her mother and father for not getting them out of Romania when they had the chance. So she has worked her way through forgiveness to that point, to forgiving her parents for that. So what benefit is there to staying a victim? This is another thing that Megan wrote down that she said during our trip. 
Here you see her beside the spot. There you can kind of see the foundation of the barrack that she and the twins were in. It's one of the ones that's been burned down, torn down. And then there is a placard outside of it commemorating the twins. Here's her little buggy that she drives around in while we're there. And then you see us here beside her with the plaque. So we wanted to kind of leave here in the last five minutes or so, we wanted to kind of leave you with what, what we take away from this trip. Okay, so two of the things that we learned about humanity. First of all, definitely cruelty. We understood, and I think we went into it knowing we would understand that the scope of Auschwitz I and Birkenau, the hugeness of them, um, really reveal how cold and calculated cruelty toward other human beings can be. But the flip side of that, or I think I guess another piece of that, is we learned about mortality. Um, and that souls perish in moments there, in moments. Um, people were actually vanished from the earth, and some of them vanished without a trace. And we have some pictures, we have some hair, but some people vanished without a trace. This life, no matter how long it is, is finite. And so what Eva teaches us, I think, is it's what we do with the time that we have that matters. We wanted to show you kind of as a piece of that, because this is the heavy part of what we learned. This is a recreation, a rebuilding of the two ovens in Auschwitz I. And so there would have been human beings forced to work here, putting other human beings into those furnaces. This was under that hill in the other picture that we showed. Two other things that we learned uh, were about individuality and commonality. So we were able to travel there with a survivor, but also with a hundred other people that we didn't know, and people that we learned a lot about on this trip, and with whom we will be close forever. And so, uh, just a couple of pictures about individuality and commonality. These are actual pieces of art from Auschwitz that prisoners created while they were there, even in those situations. They used art to express their individuality and their individual experience. And then we were able to um, have that same experience with, with people that we did not know um, before we started this trip, but were able to come to know and love over the course of eight days. And then kind of the last two lessons we want to leave you with. We learned about responsibility. Hopefully we kind of knew a little about responsibility before we went. But Eva, our guides and our fellow travelers, um, and even those that we sometimes just met along the way, um, everybody showed that they were just compelled to honor these lives that had been lost. And so this is just this responsibility to remember. And then we learned about tenacity because the Polish people have just shown immense tenacity. Um, they have endured, honestly, a heartbreaking last 200 years and yet they are determined to remember the people who have gone before them and to rebuild a beautiful, beautiful country. This is something Eva said a long time ago. The light of one single candle can illuminate the darkness for the entire universe. Use your light to illuminate some dark corner of the world. Uh, we would like to thank our husbands and families who let us go on this trip. We would like to thank uh, Mr. Todd, Dr. McGuire, and the school board for giving us this opportunity to talk tonight. And Candles Holocaust Museum for their programs and dedication to education and um, human spirit. That's one of our favorite pictures of Eva. We would also like to thank you for coming and listening. And um, now we want you documentary and learn a little bit about Eva, who, who we know and love. Thank you. And we hope very much that this actually allows us to